the virtual floor is yours. Thank you, Andy. Uh, people have questioned my numberings of six early webinars labeled 101 through 106, and uh, I've moved into a 200 series only because we are not talking about processes more so than systems, though in fact processes are systems. But our focus in this particular series is on system engineering processes, which uh, do adhere to the fundamental principles of agile systems, but we are concerned more with the operational aspects. And in this case, uh, we're going to talk about something that has been discovered uh, in the Agile Systems Engineering Lifecycle Model Project. It's been going on for a number of years now where we are trying to formulate an appropriate lifecycle model for Agile Systems Engineering by, in fact, going out and finding out what people are doing that actually works that's common to all of them, no matter how they're doing it. But uh, if they're successful in dealing with the need for agility, we want to understand what enables that. Uh, and with that, uh, I will skip the abstract. I presume you're here because you've read it. I want to give a prelude, uh, and I say prelude because there are eight findings from the ASELCM project listed on this slide. And uh, the first six have been discussed in an IS-19 paper and I will leave the reading of that paper to those of you who missed it and, in fact, want to get some more detail. But I'm going to briefly flash a slide or two for each one of them just to put context here. But, in fact, what we're really going to discuss in this webinar are the bottom two, which are not in that IS-19 paper because we have come to understand them and their important role uh, since – that paper was written a year ago, and these are the two we're going to focus on this time. Rick, your voice the is coming over one. is quite quiet. Can you talk a bit louder or get the microphone closer uh, to you? Well, uh, I can't get it any closer. I'm speaking right into it. That was better. The volume is, the volume is turned up as high as it'll go. In any event, uh, here, is, here is the life cycle framework. And uh, it is consistent with what is written in ISO IEC IEEE 24748 on uh, life cycle model. And uh, what's remarkable about, remarkable about it, for some of you, uh, it does not, uh, what's written in that standard does not indicate anything about a stair step or, or uh, a waterfall-type process of sequential tasks. In fact, it says very specifically that tasks can happen asynchronously, they can happen repeatedly, they can happen recursively, they can happen simultaneously, and in fact, what we did here was simply draw what those words said and added some things that we found in our discovery work going on and analyzing uh, case histories of cases of what other people were doing. And uh, most notably is, is the very center of the circle, situational awareness. That is a new stage that we are uh, proposing should be incorporated in the next revision of 7, uh, 24, 748, and 15288. Uh, and in fact, the situational awareness stage is the key stage in an agile environment because it is the trigger mechanism that starts up any and all of the other stages whenever the situation requires some more development or some more support or some retirement or some production or whatever. Uh, a few other changes that will find their way, at least by according to our recommendations for 15288 REV, uh, is that the production activity has got to uh, not, not just simply produce a system, but it has to evolve that system. Systems in an agile environment are, in essence, immortal. That has been said about software, but it's also true about hardware. In an environment 
that we live in today that's complex and constantly evolving. The system also has to evolve. I think I have seen three, maybe only two, but I think it's three wing changes on commercial aircraft in the last four or five years uh, on on the shape of the tips of them. And, and uh, of course, we see all kind of aircraft, uh, military especially, are constantly coming back home to get new ISR equipment and other stuff put into them. So the systems that we have that are even hardware are constantly involved. Uh, one thing worth noting, I think, is Tesla uh, doesn't have model years. I don't know if any of you actually noticed that, but uh, the Teslas that are rolling off the line are continually being evolved to the point where, in essence, every car that comes off could be different than the one that just came off before it. Uh, and uh, Tesla also downloads most of that uh, new capability into the cars that you've already bought. But any hardware change, of course, can't be done without coming back somewhere to a dealer for some retrofit. Okay, so much for for uh, what we'll talk about here. Other than I want to say that a lot of a lot of this continuous evolution, immortality of the system is enabled by a very necessary agile architecture pattern. Uh, we refer to it as AAP. I'm showing it here for two reasons. One, we're going to reference it later on, much later on. But more importantly, uh, it's not shown as one of our findings, principally because it's been, we've understood this for quite some time before we started trying to find uh, life cycle model concepts. And so it will definitely appear it will be featured very heavily in the technical product that INCOSI uh, intends to publish once we give them some material to publish, which we hope will be about a year from now. Uh, in any event, the, uh, I've shown this many times in many places. It's an iconic diagram. It basically says you've got resources that can be pulled together in a plug-and-play environment to deal with any situation of the moment of interest. Uh, and so when you have to respond to a situation, if you've got resources that can be plug and play together as a response capability, you can very quickly assemble uh, a response to a situation that is in the process of happening. Uh, we won't talk any more about this here. Okay, finding number two is something that we call the ASCLCM operational pattern. And uh, notably, it uh, references three systems. They are not they are not logical systems. You will not find well. From our perspective, these are behavioral systems. You've got a logical system there on the right. That's the target system. You've uh, got a logical system in the center. That's the system that produces the target system. But you've got a behavioral system on the left, the innovation system, which is in fact distributed throughout the other two uh, as the learning environment, uh, or I should say the learning and application environment. As things change, as things we try that don't work need to be uh, dealt with again, uh, there is this system we call the innovation system that has the responsibility of being aware when uh, the process has to change or the target system has to change, and in fact, instituting that change and making it part of the uh, memory of the system. Okay, here's another way of looking at that. On the left, we have the system engineering process. On the right, we have the system engineered product. They are intimately involved with each other. Uh, and the statement here is that you can't have an agile system engineering process if, in fact, it does not build an agile system. And the reason for that is because the essence of an Agile system engineering process is constant learning and application of that learning in real time as the process moves forward and not only produces the initial version of this the system, but also uh, continues the evolution of that system. In order to enable a system engineering process to constantly modify the system it's producing, that system itself has to be Agile and, and uh, permit affordable modification and upgrade. Okay, so 
Uh, finding number three is uh, problem space characterization uh, in, in all cases where we went uh, for the ASCLCM project. We ask that the case study people uh, who were going to present a case that we could analyze and study would characterize their environment with this framework. And, and uh, it's referred to as the CURVE framework because of the acronym is CAPRICE, Uncertainty, Risk, Variation, Evolution. More on this is written up in that IS-19 paper, and it's not the focus of this webinar. Other than to say, uh, here is something that's not in the IS-19 paper, and it is a characterization of the general systems engineering environment in that curve framework. And, and the value of this uh, is basically as a, uh, a reminder or as a trigger for anybody who is going to build a process or a system that needs to be agile, every one of the bullets that you see here in a general sense needs to be considered if, in fact, you actually want to have a successful Azure system. And as, uh, as some current work that's going on right now is, the, is defining the goals of system engineering, uh, as the top three bullets in the, uh, I mean, the top bullet and the top three uh, curve elements are survivability, relevance, and viability are the goals of of system engineering, uh, of a system, I should say. Uh, and so if you're going to build uh, a system, you've got to think in today's environment, uh, even if you're not front and center saying we're building an agile system or using an agile system engineering process, this is in fact the environment that system is going to live in. You need to consider the subtext under each of these bullets in whatever you're going to do. Uh, down here on the bottom on the left, I say S2 and S1 have cyber, physical, social dimensions, which is something we're becoming very aware of, especially in the security environment. But what we're seeing now are systems not just with human social uh, aspects to them, but also with component, component social aspects, where components are collaborating with each other Components are teaming up to accomplish things, and so we're starting now to look at the the uh, social dimension in addition to the cyber and physical dimension. Okay, and the fourth finding: operational principles, sensing, responding, evolving. Three categories: uh, echoes of John Boyd's OODA loop, observe, orient, decide, act, and the third category is evolve. Uh, very key here in this in the operational environment for your system engineering process is very proactive alertness to the external environment and what's going on in that environment, as well as very proactive alertness to what's going on internally in your process. And then, of course, you have to make sense out of it. You may become aware of lots of things that are going on and they don't need your attention, or perhaps they do, and that's the sense-making part. Responding is where you make decisions and actually take some action, and very importantly, you evaluate that action afterwards. Finally, evolving. Uh, it turns out that evolution doesn't work. You don't have a memory system. And this includes biological uh, evolution as, as well as system evolution of any kind. In biology, the memory system is in the DNA. In the systems environment, presumably, it's in an updated timeouts and upstream that goes on as well as in the uh, evolving internal culture. Uh, so those are operational principles. Again, there's more discussion in the IS-19 paper. Fifth concept is one of information debt. We became very aware of this as we came to understand that the systems that we were evaluating out there in the field in a variety of different places, serving different kind of markets, were having to evolve and often, in many cases, over many years, the teams that did the initial development <laughs> weren't involved in the evolution later on because they left the company, they moved on to other projects, or whatever. And so the concept of being able to evolve a system and a moral system very much requires real-time, accurate documentation. 
I'm not going to read this slide to you. Again, it's discussed in the IS-19 paper. It's been exposed fairly widely already. Uh, but it's, it's a key context for what we're about to look at. Response requirements is the sixth and final one we'll briefly uh, go through because we're going to spend time on seven and eight. Uh, in general, response requirements uh, might be called response strategies. Uh, uh, but in this case, there are general ones, and they're basically saying if you're going to actually deal effectively in a system engineering environment or in a systems environment that was shown in the general case under the curve characterization, then in fact, you're going to have to address the elements here that you see in order to succeed. That's not to say these are sufficient, but they are necessary. Creation is an interesting one. What does your system or your process have to be created? Well, it's got to create opportunity and risk awareness constantly. It's got to, it's got to continuously evolve response actions and options. I'm not going to read through this list. It is, again, discussed in the IS-19 paper, but it's, it's a key underpinning for the entire concepts that we're about to look at here. Uh, here we're going to focus on two findings, stakeholder engagement and continuous integration platform, which is where the principal focus is going to be. Stakeholder engagement uh, is, a, is a, uh, has a broad constituency, developers, subcontractors, security engineers, operators, producers, maintainers, customers, end users, management. Maybe I forgot somebody. Stakeholder engagement is not a new concept. <coughs> Integrated product teams have been around since the 90s. I believe those were developed with JPL. Uh, they have a, a uh, focus that basically says the emphasis is on the involvement of all stakeholders. Uh, concurrent engineering, I believe, is also something been around since the 90s and perhaps had its origins at JPL. I'm not sure about that one. But it has a, a bit of a more narrow uh, audience base, sometimes called simultaneous engine, simultaneous engineering or integrated product development. It's it's more focused on the development than the rest of the life cycle. DevOps down at the bottom is the one we're going to use as a model for discussion. Uh, it tends to be a broader one than the two above it. So uh, some people in the IPT arena may disagree. Uh, I think we can show that DevOps uh, covers integrated product team concepts and goes a bit uh, considerably further in another set of dimensions. But in any event, we want to move down to uh, looking a little closer at DevOps. Uh, engagement of stakeholders is what we're interested in. And engagement, that's kind of in uh, quotation points in that we're asking for stakeholder engagement, which is beyond involvement, which is beyond just showing up for a meeting. It's actually being engaged in the dialogue, in the collaboration, in the uh, expected uh, steering of the result that's going, to, that's going to happen. Okay, so what is DevOps? Well, DevOps... Uh, I'm going to I'm going to use some words that that I think are some of the more meaningful words that I've seen in the literature or on the internet out there. There's a guy by the name of uh, Gerardo Dane who's got seven principles of DevOps and and uh, basically I've I've uh, not taken much liberty with what he said here. He recognizes that, was, that DevOps is a software development practice, as he said, and I'm claiming it was born as. Uh, so the software people do think they own it at this point. We're starting to see it move in a number of circles into mixed discipline engineering at this point with some interpretations of how you move, how you move DevOps into mixed discipline engineering. Uh, there's no official definition. Uh, and as he says, you don't do DevOps. It's a business practice. It's an approach. 
But in any event, because there is uh, some seen work in terms of trying to understand common concepts of uh, DevOps, which gets its name from combining developments and operations in a software environment, we're going to use that as a bit of a framework. Here's his seven principles that I've taken some editorial liberty with to de-softwareize them and make them more appropriate for uh, mixed discipline engineering. The uh, key focus, end user focus, uh, you know, the seven the seven uh, principles here where I think are fairly comprehensive. And in fact, from my perspective, could be considered comprehensive. I think anything that I would want to deal with at the detail level, I could fit under one of these seven categories. A couple of things I feel are worth mentioning. Uh, collaboration uh, is, is uh, playing a much more central focused role in successful agile systems engineering than uh, I had anticipated a year ago or for sure two years ago. I always thought it was good, but now I'm getting to the point where I'm thinking it's absolutely necessary if you're going to have a successful agile system engineering process to have very effective collaboration across a broad team, uh, not just development and operations, but everybody in the team. Uh, the other one I want to make a note of here is well, automation and repetition. Uh, you know, the software people in DevOps are very high on automated testing, uh, especially regression testing. We need this in the hardware environment as well. And what I'm suggesting here is it's not the software directly that we're focused, focusing the testing on, but we're saying it's software configured and controlled regression testing. Important so that you test everything that you've tested before when you add something new into the mix. Uh, this is the regression testing concept because basically the new thing that you've added in may have passed you the test, but when you integrate it into your system, it has some interactive uh, effects with the rest of the system that passed test the last time the test was run, but now you have a difficulty because of this new addition to the system environment. The uh, seventh one is also extremely important. Monitor everything and, and basically what we're going to talk about when we look at the continuous integration platform is the need for instrumentation, instrumenting your platform uh, at a fairly uh, thoughtful level so that in fact you not only know what's going on from a performance point of view, but you also can see potential uh, problems arising. Okay, so down at the bottom it says, how do you put these principles into effective practice? I mean, these are these you know, these principles are I'm bringing up under the category of stakeholder engagement. Uh, the issue is is how do you actually put these in practice in a mixed discipline environment? In the software environment, uh, you've got uh, a demonstration capability pretty much continuously that you have with Eclipse platforms, uh, with software IDEs that give you a fairly good integrated display capability. In the hardware environment, that's not so true. So, continuous integration platforms. As I've just said, uh, software development has commercially available things like C++, Java, Eclipse that force them to develop an agile product. This is not true in hardware. Uh, but the essence, as the top of the slide says, of agile system engineering processes is the, ability, is the ability to deal with changing knowledge and changing environment. Well, how do we do this in the hardware environment? There are plenty of examples out there. They just aren't as William Gibson says, well distributed. Uh, there are spot capabilities out there where people have product line engineering concepts. Uh, I say spot capabilities. Automo automo automotive companies deal very much in product line engineering, as do quite a few others, uh, but it's not a universal concept. It does have uh, 
it does have application on a much broader basis than just things like automobiles. Uh, but we also have proprietary open system architecture, OSA. Uh, that's an agile architecture pattern concept. You'll recall the pattern was introduced earlier where we have resources that could be plug and played because there's a common interactive interface substrate that allows you to put things together. Finally, the bottom one, proprietary live virtual constructive, uh, which we're going to talk considerably more about here shortly, employs the Agile architecture pattern. So, okay, so Agile system engineering goals, produce an innovative result, a success assured result, a sustainable result rapidly. Rework is the bane of rapid. And I've come to understand after after many other different approaches that rework, the reduction of rework is probably the central value that comes from an agile approach. Uh, because in fact it allows you to do things faster and cheaper. Uh, because you're not having to spend so much time and doing something over again that you did incorrectly the first time. Okay, so a continuous integration platform addresses the need of minimizing re, uh, rework. And here we're talking about a platform for mixed discipline, mixed fire projects. The intent to fill that need is something that enables and facilitates. I don't want to read these bullets to you. You can read them. I'll just pick a few and talk about, but uh, you know, we're really talking about an ability to show demonstrations to customers, to uh, your producers who have to produce the system later, to your quality assurance people, to your mixed discipline engineering teams, plural. Uh, you want to be able to show them demonstrations of the state of the current work in process. You also very definitely want to be able to show them why something that was just recently done is going to cause a problem from an integration point of view. And so what we really want, ideally, is to have a continuous integration platform that has got the entire system integrated, day one, uh, in some proxy capability. Let's just say it's not the final system. It may be all simulations. <coughs> or it may be all low fidelity proxy devices that are being connected together in a configuration for the first time and we're discovering uh, integration issues. Uh, the one down there in the bottom, a set-based knowledge development test stand. I'm not going to talk about what set-based means. Uh, some of you, I'm sure, understand what set-based approaches mean because they've been getting a lot of attention at, at IS-19, they got quite a bit of attention. Uh, They've had uh, a fair amount of attention for the last couple of years in system, in, in COSI system engineering circles. Basically, set based design says uh, you need to run some very good experiments on the kind of uh, hardware uh, capabilities you're trying to develop so that you understand from a limit curve point of view, uh, entire set of parametric forms that work on one side of the curve and an entire set of parametric forms that don't work on the other side so that you can pick from the ones that work uh, on the correct side of the curve uh, parameters that fit the specific need at this time. Okay, so uh, Agile system engineering in both software and mixed discipline environments is very much uh, generally using iterative incremental approaches to do fast learning loops, fast learning cycles, to learn the things that set-based design can provide knowledge of right up front uh, and eliminate the need for learning as you go and having to do it over again. Toyota has got quite a bit of, oh, I should say, Toyota does this approach. There's been quite a bit of uh, Documentation and presentations produced on this. Michael Kennedy is the leading proponent. Uh, and that's as much as I'm gonna say about set-based design right now, other than to say 
continuous integration platform has the potential to provide a stat-based design workbench. Okay, so now we'll look at a few examples of continuous integration platforms. Uh, some examples I'm not going to talk about here, uh, just because I didn't think we'd have enough time, are called virtual system integration labs. And uh, I'll mention, I'll mention uh, examples that uh, virtual system integration labs are generally uh, simulation oriented, but also remotely distributed. And in fact, I have worked uh, in some project activity where the focus was on remotely distributing a system integration lab, which in essence provides a continuous integration platform in mixed discipline engineering projects that are not all being integrated in the same room. Okay, so here's an example from Boeing's F-22 team. Uh, I took some liberty with the words that they published on the page that's referenced here. But they have a system engineering lab that uh, has a uh, flying component to it to where they can upload into workstations on that test bed, that flying test bed, a whole bunch of new software modifications that they want to try and test in the system and send it up. And as they say here, we can accomplish in a day what used to take a month. Uh, because they're actually putting it in a real environment. And in essence, what they've got is a workstation that is running new software for uh, how the plane should operate, but it's not directing the plane to operate that way. It's instead watching what the plane does instead with its uh, legacy environment and recording all that information that when the test bed lands again, uh, it is connected up with the uh, static system engineering lab that's in a room, and uh, together all that information is uh, dealt with in a way that, uh, in essence, gives us a very interesting concept for a continuous integration platform. Uh, now we'll look at three, three of the platforms we saw in the case studies we did for the ASCLCM project. Baywar is working on uh, new technology for off-road vehicle uh, to support warfighters. And in fact, they have, uh, there's an example of two of their continuous integration platforms. Every six months, they, they, they have uh, an increment of new technology that uh, in theory gets installed on those platforms. In practice, they get installed on those platforms, not just at the end of the six month cycle, but continuously throughout uh, the six months as work in process uh, develops enough additional capability that they want to put it on the platform and test it with everything else that's already there to see if there are integration issues. And so in essence, they have a continuously evolvable set of, continu of continuous integration platforms here that get work in process put on them frequently uh, up until the end of the six month period where finally everybody installs what they say this is the final, uh, the final uh, version of what we're delivering to the city. Uh, Rockwell Collins, they make military radios, which means they're making printed uh, circuit boards with FPGAs on them that provide new capabilities in a radio that has new capability requirements. A project consists of many such boards that have to get put into uh, a container of some kind. In many cases, those containers are reusable off-the-shelf line, re line replaceable units that have been used before. But the issue for them is one of being able to interface what's going on in electronic circuit board development in a work in process continuous uh, capability environment with what's going on in the independent software development. Well, the software development people are, well, are working on two-week two week increments. The hardware people 
uh, can't work on two-week increments, but they have broken down their work into acceptable incremental time frames. But they've also done something very interesting in a way of a continuous integration platform. They basically have a standard rack for printer circuit cards that they have picked up with uh, the necessary interfaces to the outside world and to computer configuration capabilities to where the software people who are independently developing uh, increment uh, iterations every two weeks can uh, put their software into the controlling computer that is then accessing what's in this rack, which consists of some uh, previously built electronic circuit boards that may in fact be intended for use in the final project or in fact may be proxies of uh, not quite full capability but sufficient capabilities to help iron out integration issues. They also have uh, general purpose FPGA boards that you can buy off the shelf out in the market that they do some of their initial coding in that reside in their continuous integration platform. And of course, as they get uh, closer to building uh, a real custom-made printed circuit board, they'll do some breadboards that can be connected into that continuous integration platform. And eventually, they have finished circuit boards that they can put in there. So they have in their continuous integration platform a constantly evolving set of working process to different levels of hardware that is connected up to the software that's happening externally. Okay, then there's Lockheed, which uh, we've saved for last because it's the intro to key concept for live virtual constructive. Uh, this particular case study was done at Lockheed Fort Worth, where they do upgrades to F-16, F-22s. Constantly seeing the same planes come back over and over again, uh, and so they they've learned that there is value in having an open system architecture in those planes because they're going to be constantly upgrading modules that are in there. But in any event, what they've done for our perspective here that we think is really neat is they have something they call an ANTE, A N T E, which stands for Agile Non-Target Environment. And in essence, it's a system integration lab, a preliminary system integration lab. Uh, and they call it the Agile non-target environment because their final lab is going to be sitting on an, air, on, on an aircraft test, test bench. This sits in a room instead, so it's the non-target environment. And very importantly, they say to all of their subcontractors and all of their internal self, uh, subcontractors are developing devices, internal people are developing software, they say to everybody involved, the first thing you have to do is provide a simulation of what you intend to build that we can run in the ANSI so that we can very quickly bring up an entire integrated system. Now, I'm exaggerating only slightly because, of course, the initial simulations that come in are not complete simulations yet. They, too, will evolve. But they're trying to get an understanding for how all these different pieces uh, of hardware and pieces of software are going to behave when they actually get connected to each other. So in addition to simulations, they sometimes use low fidelity proxy devices that they buy off the shelf or that they find in their library of reusable modules that they built in the past. And they'll use those in the systems as real pieces of hardware that will get upgraded when the replacement device that comes with more capability is actually ready. Uh, okay, again, they, they uh, make this a requirement of their subcontractors who are building devices to, to send in a uh, simulation of that device as soon as possible. So what they get is early and incremental demonstration of working concepts, early exposure to difficulties in need of attention. They funded the development of this activity themselves. Uh, to skepticism from the customer who about a year and a half later, uh, about a year and a half ago, uh, about a year and a half after the anti-concept started, 
all of a sudden fell in love with it because they recognize that when they come and look at a demonstration, they're actually seeing work in process that functions in an integrated environment and, in fact, is discovering integration issues because of conflicting capabilities that have been requested. So they have multiple customers, and the feedback they're getting from every one of them is, what a great idea this is. Okay, so what, <laughs> what does this look like in general? There is a live virtual constructor, continuous integration platform concept, uh, live components, virtual components, and constructive capabilities that basically configure a system of the moment to undergo test or demonstration that consists of some number of possible simulations and some number of possible live equipment, whether it's actually finished equipment or stand-in proxy equipment. Systems can be configured for test, for demonstration, for collaborative discussion amongst this mixed discipline engineering environment. Uh, LVC is the concept very accurately, but if you go out and look up live versus constructive on the internet, basically mostly what you're going to get is all about military training that uses simulation mix, mixtures of simulations, live equipment people, and a configuration constructive capability for wargaming. Uh, that dominates the internet for LVC. Okay, so you want one of these, but you can't buy it. You have to design it, you have to build it, you have to continuously evolve it. And how do you justify it right off the bat? Well, I don't know how Lockheed at the IFG group justified it, but they clearly did. They never talked about an uphill or an incremental battle that was required. But what is suggested here is an incremental approach to design, build, evolve a continuous integration platform because it will cost you money and it will cost you time. And the thing that has to be done first is in the spirit of the agile architecture pattern, you've got to develop the infrastructure that permits plug and play activity. And so you have to specify the interface. And, and the AAP, the agile architecture pattern says there are five categories of import, socket signal, security, safety, service, that has to be specified so that uh, anything you're going to be able to do in the way of connecting simulations or connecting devices together understands that they have to perform according to a standard interface requirement. And that's, so that's the first thing that has to be done. And a concept of operations and an op operations concept needs to be developed for whatever maturity level you're going to hit the ground running with initially. And uh, from that point on, I've got a bunch of things that need to be, that should be considered for application uh, based on the environment you're working in, based on the environment your system's going to work in, uh, based on the appetite for your organization to fund it. Uh, but in, in any event, the recommendation, of course, is to pick the low hanging fruit first. And the low-hanging fruit is the stuff that costs the least and gives the most demonstrable value so the continued investment will be encouraged. Uh, what we're looking at here is, is uh, bringing up a capability that gives early and frequent work in process stakeholder feedback. And as it happens at Lockheed, it can happen in an environment that takes this incremental approach uh, that early feedback should very easily illuminate rework cost and time avoidance. Oh, look what we just discovered. Uh, and of course, uh, if you're analytical in your approach, you can compare uh, similar projects that start using a continuous integration platform with those that didn't have that capability, and you can show how much rework was reduced. Uh, okay, I think that's all I'm going to say about what you see up there. You've had plenty of time to read that. Uh, but, okay, so wrap up. We briefly went through the uh, top six things uh, of the, the, the top six. I don't want to say the top six. 
I want to say six of the findings that happen to be on the top of this diagram here uh, briefly, and we added two that are more recent that were not covered in the IS-19 paper. We are continuing to add more, by the way. The first item on the list, the life cycle framework, very much supports all of these things, or <laughs> I should say not only supports, depends upon all of these things below it to be effectively operated. Uh, especially this continuous integration platform when we're talking about sustaining uh, an immortal, agile product that's out there in the field that's coming off the product line, the production line, uh, let's say like Tesla where there are frequent changes made in production, a working process as better product capabilities understood. Uh, we, in that, we, we very much have a circular life cycle model that's very much triggered through all this activity by situational awareness. And the continuous integration platform is a major source of that situational awareness. And uh, with that, I'm going to say, I'm not gonna read these to you. This is a reference, it, it'll be in the slides. Of a couple of LVC, live virtual constructive applications that in fact weren't military training based that are more specific to the kinds of things we're talking about in rapid prototype and testing. You can look at those to the extent that you have such an interest. Here's some references and additional info on the material we just talked about. Uh, in particular, uh, the third one from the top up there is the uh, IS-19 paper that talks about those first six things. The four guys at the bottom are the case studies that we did on the project. And uh, for the record, on the slide, we show the history of this whole series. And with that, Andy, I'll turn it over to you for Q&A. Hmm? Okay, Rick, thank you for a great presentation on Agile Systems and Processes 202, Mixed Discipline Continuous Integration. Now looking through the, the questions, and the first one you've actually answered with your last slide, which is, could you share the link to the IS-19 paper that you referred to a lot? And it was there on that slide. So when the uh, presentation is posted uh, on the Incozy Connect website, people will be able to find that there. Next question uh, from Stephen. Interesting requirement for real-time accurate documentation. This seems to be one area where Agile SE is at odds with, with Big A, Agile Manifesto, that values working software over comprehensive documentation. A stumbling block for mixed discipline engineering? Uh, <laughs> there is no stumbling block for mixed discipline engineering if you're referring to it being caused by the Agile Manifesto, because quite frankly, mixed discipline system engineering has no interest in the Agile Manifesto, other than referring to it from now and saying, is there something there we can learn? But it is not. It's not a forcing function, it's not a direction, it's not a set of principles that drive what Agile System Engineering is about. So the, the uh, issue of uh, documentation that uh, is late, not real time enough, uh, is equally deleterious to software as it is to hardware. Because we're talking about an environment where the systems that are being produced have to be evolved, have to be sustained, and in general, they're going to be evolved and sustained by people who weren't there initially, if they live long enough to enjoy that. Uh, and therefore, there needs to be, especially in the hardware environment, sustainable, maintainable documentation right off the bat. So I have a question from Robert. Would you consider digital models of ever-increasing detail sufficient to provide a continuous integration platform even for hardware systems as envisioned on slide 23. And I think that's actually covered in some of your uh, later material, but uh, I'll leave it open as a question. The, uh, I mean, the, the brief answer is absolutely. Uh, but of course, what we're looking for here are execu executable digital models, uh, which in fact become simulations at that point. Uh, and so, you know, the, the difference between a model and a simulation loses distinction 
when you can execute those models. A question from Stephen. In some earlier work, the life cycle model had a research stage. Could you explain why this is no longer in the model? The, the, uh, the, six, the six stages you see around the perimeter there are taken right out of the IEEE standard that says these are the six common stages. Uh, it recognizes that there are other stages that there are life cycle models where these same six stages are divided up differently into eight or nine. Uh, so research fits into the concept, you know, research in, in any real sense fits into the concept development activity. Uh, however, in an agile environment, I'll go further and say uh, and a, a good sound agile approach is making very good use of experimentation in the development environment, where it's uh, sometimes developing uh, an experiment that uh, only produces knowledge. It doesn't produce an artifact that will use, be used by anything else because, in fact, it may say that was a bad idea. Uh, but, in fact, we very much want to do that and find out uh, bad ideas so that we uh, find some good ones in there. And that's a form of research. Uh, I believe, too. So we, we can have research in the development phase as well as in the concept phase. But uh, they are there. Uh, as I, again, I said, the IEEE standard recognizes those six that you see there on the perimeter as being common to all life cycle models. And so that's, that's how we use that. And you can fit research in appropriately where you want it. And you can fit other things that some other models have appropriately in those six. But situational awareness is not present in the standard. There's a question from Alexander. Uh, the ASLCM operational pattern, is it visible somehow in functional or any other structure of an organization? Did you observe such cases like dedicated department for life cycle managers, of, of life cycle managers, or even dedicated roles who have to think by the separation of concerns? Uh, yes, we did. Uh, and in fact, we saw it uh, almost everywhere, I mean, every, absolutely everywhere we went uh, in different forms at, at the uh, Navy Bay War environment. Uh, it was very much the uh, leader of the group, and I don't know that he had a, a, a title like project manager or program manager, but in, in essence, he functioned as that for uh, this multi-sponsor set of projects that were all about off-road vehicle technology development. He was uh, very much, I've lost track of the question. I think we're dealing with situational awareness. Uh, we're dealing with the innovation system, yes. and. So he is, he is, he basically is a very special person. He basically, and it's outlined in the case study for the Stay War environment very poignantly, where he took it as a personal responsibility and enjoyable responsibility to be in touch with all of his subcontractors, all of their workers that were working on devices for the project, and all of his engineers. On a daily basis, he understood was anybody all of a sudden no longer engaged? Uh, if so, let's find out why, let's find out how. Uh, the, the Lockheed group had, in fact, a, they went through a transformation from, from waterfall to agile in about three years, about two and a half years. Uh, and they had a special team of about six people that managed that whole transformation. And they functioned as that innovation system, well, I don't want to say they functioned. They were a key part of that in innovation system, is what I wanted to say, because they were constantly evaluating as they rolled out this, this safe like, a highly tailored safe like process at Lockheed. They were constantly evaluating how well is it working or not working? What do we have to learn? Uh, about its not workingness, 
so that we can change that activity and make it work better. Uh, and what they said at the end of about two and a half years is we now have turned on, we have now dissolved this special group because the, the concepts have been so well and so broadly acculturated into 2,100 engineers working in teams that they take they've taken over this responsibility of constant learning and and uh, modification. So I have a question from Matthew. What role, if any, do you see 3D printing having for hardware continuous integration? Uh, that sounds like a loaded question uh, <laughs> with an obvious answer. I mean, uh, 3D printing, you know, is the holy grail. Uh, I used to run a 3D, 3D printing company, did, did so for a year as an interim exec, got very heavily involved in metal part 3D printing. Uh, there's actually 3D printers that can make production parts these days. Uh, there are 3D printers that are making electronic circuit boards uh, today. Uh, I mean, they, they, for sure, they play already a very valuable role in prototyping. Uh, can you do production work with them? Yes, but it depends on uh, the nature of the part you're talking about. Uh, the uh, the cost effectiveness of the run lengths you're going to run, uh, but yes, I mean what we want, I mean you know what, what we say about the the advantage that software people have is uh, one side of their brain. Well, I don't want to say one side. I want to say their brain for five minutes is doing design work, and then for five minutes it's doing fabrication work, design fabrication. It doesn't need to pass a document between itself. Hardware people can't do that until they have effective employment of 3D printing, because then, in fact, they can do the same thing. They can design and fabricate. So I think we're out of time. There are a few more questions. So I'll summarize all of the questions and send them to Rick so that he can reach out if there are particular ones he wants to discuss with you. So. Um, Thank you uh, again for a great talk, Rick, and thank you to the audience for your questions and your time. Next slide, please, to, uh, uh, Rick, if you can go through to the first of the last ones. <laughs> That's it. Um, the next slide shows our upcoming schedule. The next webinar will be held on Wednesday, the 16th of October 2019, when Stefan Bonnet will give a presentation on Fostering Model-Based Systems Engineering in the Corporate Engineering Culture, the Thales Story. On Wednesday, the 23rd of October 2019, Sarah Sheard will give a presentation on what systems engineers should know about software, part two. Additional webinars will be offered typically on the third Wednesday of each month through 2019 and through 2020. Uh, and please note, if you go to the website shown here, you'll see more information about the webinar series, including a way to view the last 130 webinars, and soon this webinar as well. Next slide, please. As mentioned earlier, you can now claim one PDU credit towards your systems engineering professional recertification by attending this webinar. You may also just claim this credit um, retrospectively for Incozy webinars that you have attended and where attendance meets the qualification requirements. Please contact INCOSI if you wish to know which webinars you intend, attended and if you met the qualification requirements. Thank you again and goodbye.